everybody, it's Lon Sybin, and I am really excited today because Blake Harris, the author of Console Wars, a great book which I just read, is joining us. Let me pop his uh, mug up here on the screen. Uh, Blake, thanks for joining us. Um, really enjoyed the book. I was, uh, I was telling you right before we started recording that uh, when I was 13, I had this cable access show that kind of got inspired out of all the developments in the video game industry in the late 80s. Uh, I think it was Game Players Magazine and Electronic Gaming Monthly were the two that I was like into. <laughs> and um, I, I had this show where I would go on and like talk about everything that I read about in the magazine. And there was this great uh, game store called the Ultimate Game Club, which was like right in the town next over from me. So they had all these Japanese games so you could see all the stuff <laughs> coming down the horizon. And it was... Uh, it was pretty exciting. What I loved about your book uh, was the fact that this is really covering the beginnings of all of that, that the, you know, the start of the industry and, and really the underdog story that, that was Sega. What, what inspired you to, to write this book? Because I, obviously this might have been a, a tough sell to publishers, right? Yeah, I mean, although I didn't have the cable access show, um, for <laughs> me too, this, this era of gaming, uh, the NES and also the Super Nintendo and the Genesis, like just really inspired my interest in this whole growing industry and, uh, you know, is responsible for some of my best memories socially and just personally during that time period. So that's kind of what inspired me. Um, but, you know, what actively got the ball rolling was three and a half years ago, my brother got me a Sega Genesis for my birthday. And it was the first time I picked up a controller in 15, 20 years, however long it's been. Um, and I kind of expected it to be really cute and nostalgic and kind of easy. But I found that the games were still really challenging. They held up the test of time, and it you know, brought back a lot of those memories. And so before I even wanted to uh, write Console Wars, I honestly just wanted to read it. I wanted to know what was going on behind the scenes, who, were, who was making these decisions that was influencing my entire childhood. Um, and you know, to your point about it being a tough sell to publishers, it was because you know, where I thought that there was a, a market uh, demand to fill by the fact that there was no book on Sega or Nintendo or, you know, there were so few books about the video game industry out there. Um, I thought that was a great opportunity, and it was, um, but it also was a tough sell. Um, you know, publishers mostly said the reason that there aren't books out there is because they don't sell, and I thought, well, that's kind of strange because there aren't really many books out there for you to, it's a very small sample size. Right. Um, and luckily, <laughs> the sales have been pretty strong, and you know, it's really my sincerest hope that um, this book, in whatever small way, does inspire others to write about the industry and these pioneers and great figures behind the scenes who are responsible for all this. And not only is this book now becoming a, a book, uh, it's becoming yeah. a documentary and it's becoming a feature film. Seth Rogen and, and Evan Goldberg uh, found this really in a, a compelling story enough to, to put a lot into this. So how did this happen? Did you know them? Did How did, how did you get to that point? Um, just persistence and being really lucky um you know the the news came out earlier this year in february that seth and evan were uh attached to write and direct a feature film for sony pictures uh, but we'd actually been working together on this for over two years now um in january of 2012 i went out to go meet them in los angeles and that itself was really like the greatest moment of my life uh or at least professionally, I should say. I have a fiance, so that was... <laughs> right, that's getting a, engaged was the greatest Number moment. two to that. That's exactly <laughs> it. Um, but what happened was I had uh, written an early draft of the book proposal. This was before it even went out to publishers. And I asked my manager if he would mind sending it to uh, Seth and Evan's company. I had met with them be previously because um, I have a screenwriting background and you know, never with Seth and Evan themselves, but just sort of one of the creative execs over there. Um, so I didn't think there was much chance that they would actually give this the time of day or that... I would ever go to them, but you know, sort of just speaking to the importance of the subject matter and, and how much it resonates with people of our generation, you know, did get to Seth and Evan. They totally got it right away, um, and I went out to meet them, and they decided that they wanted to do the documentary and the feature film. And since then, we've been working on both of those. And uh, right now, we're in post production on the documentary, and uh, they're about to start writing the feature film in the next couple months. You know, what really struck me was some of the biggest problems in the industry. So we had, you know, the video game industry, which was Atari and, and, and the collapse. And, and these were American companies that built and kind of collapsed as this happened. And then you had Nintendo really out of nowhere, right? Just created this Absolutely. <laughs> amazing uh, thing that all of us grew, grew up on. And, and uh, you know, but the, it seemed as though like the, there was a huge cultural disconnect between the Japanese companies and the American companies. And uh, Sega hired uh, Tom Kleminsky to kind of, right, to try to make yeah. this work. And he took a very American approach to marketing 
a Japanese product, and, and Nintendo kind of just stayed the course. What were some of the things that, that really surprised you in this story as you, were, as you were researching it about those cultural divides and other things? Yeah, I mean, a lot of the early revelations for me were sort of of the no-duh nature, and I'm sure most people had either thought about this before or it really already you know, made sense to them, but just the fact that, as you said, um, Nintendo, Sega, and then Sony, the three great console companies of that era, all Japanese companies, um, and the book, for the most part, focuses on the American subsidiaries. Um, and so Nintendo of America introduced the NES in 1985. Um, they resurrected the industry over here pretty much single-handedly. Um, and it was run... At first, it was just surprising and interesting to me that the head of the Nintendo of America was the son-in-law of the president of Nintendo Corporate Limited. Um, so that made for an interesting dynamic. And then Tom Kalinske joined Sega of America in 1990. And, you know, I guess I just never really thought that much about the America, the, the difference between America and Japan. And for me, you know, as I got deeper into the subject matter and sort of began to realize that maybe even the battle between Sega and Nintendo wasn't as interesting as that between Sega of America and Sega of Japan. Um, you know, I, I had no idea that in J Japan, Sega with the Mega Drive, as it was called over there, was never really that popular. It was never really that successful. Um, I was recently looking at some statistics and, uh, between 1989 and 1994, the main years of the Genesis 16-bit Mega Drive, it never sold over a million units in Japan. Really? Whereas in wow. America, it sold uh, you know half a million the first year and ended up selling um, uh, over four million units a year. Um, so not only is that just surprising, but when the parent company is producing virtually the same product as is being sold in America and they're doing significantly worse, uh, that makes for interesting you know, an interesting dynamic and an interesting drama, as you see in the book, that really, um, you know, it was more than just a, a, a cultural and emotional rift, but it actually changed the course of the company um, for probably the worse in hindsight. Yeah, it's very true, because it seemed like things just kind of fell apart. You know, they couldn't, they couldn't get the success to stay. It wasn't something that yeah. Sega could really work with. And, you know, it was funny because I was a, a a big, well, I had a Nintendo, and then a few of my friends, like there was this uh, uh, teenage son of one of my mother's friends who like, I idolized, and he had the Sega, and I was like, oh, this thing's awesome, because Gary's <laughs> into the Sega. So I went out and uh, got, ma got a Master System, the 3D thing, you know, and I was trying to get all my awesome. friends on board, like, this is, thing's awesome. It really was technically superior to the Nintendo in many ways, but um, just couldn't catch on. And then when the Genesis came out, um, this was funny because there wasn't release dates back then. So yep. I was uh, at Toys R Us one night and it's there, like in the case. I'd been reading about this amazing thing and we almost got Sega to send us a demo unit for the cable show, but they, we were too small at the time. <laughs> so uh, I should have stuck with it. I'd be a millionaire right now on this thing. Um, but uh, so there it was, like in just there. It just showed up. So I was able to um, uh, kind of bribe my uh, parents into letting me uh, purchase it. <laughs> it was $189. You know, for you, it, you know, it sounds like that, that guy, Gary, yep. uh, was the, like, sort of the reason that you were pulled towards Team Sega over Nintendo. Right. Um, do you know why he ended up getting the, the Genesis or I guess the Master System back then? Was it technical superiority? Was it just some whim that his parents got him that instead of the Nintendo? I think Nintendo? that's exactly it. I think his parents got him that instead of the Nintendo <laughs> or somebody he knew had it. Or, and that was, that was it because some, some kids were just Sega kids, right? Like they, that's what they, they played with. And what's funny was when the Genesis really caught on, I felt kind of vindicated, right? Because, yeah. hey, you've, you guys now see what I saw. And, uh, and it was funny what reading about Tom Kalinske was that he really got American kids, didn't he? Like he knew what sold. Absolutely. You know, before, you know, <laughs> before we even got to the Sega part of his career, the first time I spoke with him, I realized that this guy, more than almost any other adult, was responsible for my childhood, other than my parents. Um, just with, you know, hit after hit in his career with uh, helping to develop the Flintstones kids' chewable vitamin, vitamins and then going to Mattel and helping to revive the Barbie doll, helping to do for boys what Barbie did for girls with He-Man Masters of the Universe, uh, being <laughs> responsible for uh, helping to develop and sell Popples, which was one of my strangely favorite toys from that time period, then going to Matchbox. And, you know, just all along the way, hit after hit. Um, so there were certainly, you know, a lot of things that happened at Sega during the time that were, you know, weren't directly re because of him, um, that was because of either the team around him or because of the developers in Japan. But just this guy, you know, to be able to catch lightning in a bottle that many times shows that there's really something special about the way he thinks and the way he's able to connect with, with kids. And, you know, one of the most enjoyable things for me was obviously I, I spoke with him almost every day for about three years by the end of it. Um, and, you know, he's still doing 
amazing things. And that was so nice for me. Um, you know, this wasn't just me writing about uh, high school quarterbacks glory years, but um, he really is as, as cool and as impactful as I think I described him in the book. Um, and, you know, he went on to uh, college universe where they helped uh, fund and really create leapfrog and blackboard. And then he was on the board at leapfrog uh, or he's still on the board at leapfrog. And just, you know, he's, he has an uncanny ability to connect with a, a young audience and, you know, I think that that's really defined a lot of us who grew up in the 80s and 90s. What really struck me about him, too, first of all, this book is, is, is a great entertaining read just because of the, the whole way you weave the story. But it's also a really good Thank marketing you. and business book because it shows, you know, that you can be the, the underdog, the little guy, and actually succeed if you've got the right product and take advantage of the right circumstances. And what struck me about Kalinsky was two things. Well, three things, maybe. Um, one was how you know, keen he was about the American kid, about what they wanted. Uh, the second was just how good of a manager he was, at least from reading the depiction in the story about, you know, he didn't come in and just clean house when he took over at Sega, did he? No. Um, you know, I think that I asked him, you know, during the documentary interview, did he see himself as a quarterback, as a coach? You know, there's a lot of sports metaphors in the book, and he and I both love sports. You know, where did he see himself? And he definitely saw himself as a coach. And I think that with a lot of coaches that come into teams, um, you know, that don't clean house, it's, it's not so much about a turnover in personnel. It's about how to maximize the value of each person that you have on the roster. And, and that's what he's, that, that's what, you know, that above all else, I think is what he's great at. He'd be the first to admit that his success every step of the way was a team effort. Um, but it's just his ability to get the most out of the team uh, to sort of have that underdog mentality and also have that killer instinct and also always do it with a smile on his face. He's a really optimistic, upbeat guy. And, you know, some of the things that happened later in the book would have given him reason to throw a tantrum right. or walk out the room. That's what I would have done. Um, he, kept but, going. Know, he, he always keeps his cool. Um, and it's really impressive. You know, sort of uh, one of my goals with writing this book is really to shine a spotlight on these great pioneers of the video game industry. And Tom Kalinske is obviously one of them. You know, I think that he was just a, you know, a visionary and responsible for a lot of how we've transformed from video game industry being childish play things like Nintendo was making into a, a mainstream entertainment like it is today. Um, and I was honestly surprised that nobody had written this book before and that, and that I had never heard of Tom Kalinske, nor had a lot of people before. I told the story. Yeah, I hadn't. I mean, I really didn't know who was behind what was going on there. And you know, the other thing about him too was that he was a really good, um, you know, not only a good manager, a good supportive uh, support of his staff. Didn't come in and just you know clean house, but he was also really um, keen on on the market. Like he really knew he had a good gut about what was going to work, what wasn't going to work. Um, and he also knew just how much of even when they were at their pinnacle of Sega of just you know almost dominating the the 16-bit market uh, he knew the end was near right he, he had a, a, a gut feel that um, this was not going to last forever and they and that Sega needed to pivot and get into the next uh, wave of consoles he went out and talked to uh, Sony and uh, and to uh, uh, Silicon Graphics and and the two systems that ended up beating him were ones that Sega kind of dropped the ball <laughs> on right I mean he, he really yeah. knew it he, he had the premonition that this was going to go badly and and the Japanese uh, end of the company just wasn't playing along and yet he towed the company line was he really frustrated i must have been um, he was really frustrated and one of the other things that really impressed me about him that, that i didn't mention in the book was so he just did sort of see the writing on the wall about a year and a half before the rest of the world did and maybe even a year before those that his employees saw and a lot of that was because he had access to things that no one else saw and he carried that burden uh, but so he sort of knew that things were going to go downhill or or he anticipated it and uh you know, Ellen Beth Van Buskirk, um, who, who's a big part of the story, she left the company um, to go work for Sega Channel. It was in New York. And in uh, the middle of this all, while it was going downhill, but it sort of was still rosy on the outside, she met with Tom and he talked to her about this. And he said, you know, it, it's probably going to go downhill. And, and, and she said, you know, why don't you leave? You, you're, you have a lot of other opportunities. And he said that he felt it was his responsibility as, of the, as the captain of the ship to like stay there and be there until the end. And I think a lot of executives would not have done that they would have left at, at the pinnacle of it but you know tom's just the kind of guy that felt like he needed to be there maybe he could have changed the outcome but you know uh, he he felt like very dedicated to his people um and, and they are all dedicated to him you know I, I i really got that sense um throughout from everyone i spoke with and i spoke with over 200 people and, and it was really nice to be able to tell the story about this team that was felt so strongly about one another 
And he's really not like the, the kind of CEO that fits the stereotype these days. You know, he, he wasn't, you know, just like a bull in a china shop and just clean, cleaned out the place and treated people like, you know, like garbage. He actually, you know, built something and, and, and really respected the, the people on his team. It was really just neat to see his management style and see how successful it was. And what really struck me was that, you know, despite Japan shutting him down on everything that he thought <laughs> they needed to do to continue the growth that they had, uh, he would not share that frustration with employees, did he? He, he really you know, just said as bad of an idea as it was, he, he made it like it was fine, right? Like yeah, 32 no. X in particular. <laughs> um, if nothing else, you know, he was just a wonderful shield and he considered that one of his responsibilities. He, he could have definitely brought that bad mood back to his team. He could have definitely, uh, you know, paid it forward and been angry with them or yelled at them, but he really was able to put that emotional side um, to the side and not let that impact the way he treated his team if he didn't think that that would actually motivate or help them. And, you know, th there seems to be a, obviously a big focus on the American side of the business, obviously, because this is what the story's about. Did you have a hard time getting in touch with the <laughs> Japanese components of the companies that were <laughs> involved oh, in this? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, maybe not such a hard time getting in touch with them, but yeah. getting them to speak with me, I had right. an almost impossible time. Um, and so because the story is so much American-focused um, for that reason, and, and because, you know, there aren't, there aren't always great things to say about the Japanese side of things, I admittedly was worried that I wasn't giving a fair um, snapshot of this picture, and maybe that is the case. Um, but two things really helped push me along in that area, and one was that um, I was hired a few years ago by Sega of America to shoot some short documentaries at Sega of Japan, so I spent time at Sega of Japan nowadays, and I felt like everything I'd been told was true. And granted, it's 20 years later, so you can't make a direct correlation between what I was seeing right. now and what they were seeing then. But I felt like the culture that they described was there. And then also during that trip, um, Nakayama-san, Hayao Nakayama, who was the president of Sega Enterprises, had me over to his house for tea for a few hours. Um, and everything that I felt like they said about him was true. And he um, spoke to me off the record. But I, I got a sense that what I was hearing from all these people was, was pretty accurate. And he was kind of frustrated, too, it seems like, because he, he really pushed for Tom Kleminski, so much so that he sought him out on a beach in Maui on vacation, right, to, to get him on a plane to go to Tokyo. And, and I'll tell you, Kleminski's probably got the most understanding <laughs> spouse in the world. I, I, <laughs> I can't think of many uh, spouses that would be okay with their husband just going to Japan to, to, uh, from the vacation to get hired by somebody. But, you know, uh, Nakayama really pushed for this, and he really fought his own board in this, in this whole story, it seems like, too, right? Yeah, I think that because of his relationship with David Rosen and just sort of his upbringing as an underdog himself and not really, you know, the creme de la creme in uh, Japanese society, he had a very Western mentality, at least amongst Japanese business leaders. And like you said, I think he was frustrated, too. He, as, as, as much as he was in charge, he was beholden in some ways to the board of directors, uh, the same board of directors that Tom didn't have the greatest experiences with. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, um, when I spoke to Tom, I asked if he blame Nakayama or at least back then and he said you know I really didn't feel like it was his fault I felt like he was just doing what the board wanted him to do because for the most part Nakayama-san really enjoyed the aggressive and bold strategies that um, the American division was doing and just wanted the Japanese group to try to be more like them um, so that was also very interesting that dynamic with the leader in Japan also kind of feeling more American and, and still not really having that executed out there. And now, of course, Sega is, is it, it was it was funny, like the moment for me that I said, wow, this is like a different world is when there was that, that I forgot what game it was. It was like some Olympic game where so, uh, Mario and Sonic are in the same Nintendo game, right? Yeah. It, it, come, it came full circle. Did, did Tom, it, there wasn't any talk about that in the book. Obviously, this is a, a later era now. But did Tom talk about that at all, that somehow there's now this detente between <laughs> these two warring powers? Yeah, I've gotten mixed reviews or mixed opinions when I asked the Sega people, like, what's it like to see? Mario and Sonic in the same game, or you know, my, as my, my as my seven year old cousin said when I asked him, "What do you know about Mario and Sonic?" He said, "Oh, they're friends." And I was like, "No, they hate each other." Right. <laughs> uh, so I, you know, Tom is. <laughs> uh, I think he's kind of just instinctively like, "What? That's 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 sacrilege to see the two of them together." But some of the Sega of America people um, really like that. Um, not even just that it's you know Sega and Nintendo now holding hands after all these years. Uh, but just this, this, just the fact that this character that they helped grow and, and develop and, and bring into the world 20 years ago is still around in such a meaningful way, which he really is, you know. And in the entire gaming world, I think only Mario and Sonic really, after two 
three decades still have that that brand name value. Yeah, and they're, and they're making new games that that are really just kind of uh, you know uh, just paying homage to the old ones. That you know they're obviously they're updating the technology and everything, but right. it's still continuing. And I think back too because I'm looking at you know reading this book, and you know, I'm a father now, and and I have a 13 month old, 14 month old, and it, it's one of those things where. Like when I was growing up, none of the things that my parents played with were cool, right? Um, kids today are right. playing with the same stuff we played with as, as, as kids their age, right. and it's still cool. It's really, it's, it's pretty amazing. Maybe because the digital stuff really kind of preserves it in place. But, um, so let me ask you this. So now we, you know, we, the book is out, the documentary is on the way. Um, are you now hearing from people that wish they had talked to you <laughs> during the, the course <laughs> of publishing or writing the book? Uh, yeah, definitely. I'm hearing from people who wish that they had talked to me and hearing from people who talked to me that <laughs> maybe regretted talking to me. <laughs> um, no, they're not really. I'm mostly joking about that. But yeah, um, I definitely um, am hopeful that there will be a paperback version of the book and that I'll get to uh, add a little bit more color from people who are speaking with me. And, you know, at first it wasn't even just people who had declined to speak with me or people who had spoke with me but not really made too much time, but also those I had been speaking with a lot. You know, the stories continue to come in. And at first, I thought like, oh, damn, you know, I just turned in the book a week ago and there's another story. But then I realized, you know, I, I still love the subject matter. My, the whole reason I got into it was because of my personal curiosity. So I'm just I'm continuing to interview people, continuing to take down these stories, whether it's just for my own personal benefit or whether it ends up being in a paperback edition or whether I end up writing an article about it. I don't know. But it's just so fascinating to me, all the stuff going on then, um, you know, because it affected me. And also the business side, there's so many lessons to glean. Um, you know, they're, they're timeless, universal business lessons. Absolutely. That, that's the one thing, because as a business person also, it's just, this, this is like, this book just tickled all those right <laughs> nerves for me. And it was just amazing, because all the things that you worry about, you know, these are the things that can happen if you're not on top of it. And, and, and Kleminsky was, but his, his Japanese board of directors weren't. Richard Mitchell in the chat room reminds us that Legend of Zelda is also a, a long-lasting IP from uh, Nintendo as well, which it is absolutely for, for yeah, sure. Yeah, Zelda is awesome. I think they... <laughs> um, I, I wish that Link's name was Zelda, or I don't <laughs> yeah. wish that it was, but I feel like it always kind of hurt it a little bit that the main character wasn't actually named Zelda. That's but yeah, true. That's, but that's not true. even just not even just Link and Zelda. Uh, I mean, Nintendo still has those great IPs that have sustained over the years with Star Fox, Donkey Kong, pretty much the whole crew in Mario Kart. Um, and somebody asked me recently, you know, what other games, what games today have that kind of power that could even command a cartoon and, and nothing really i mean that's mostly a byproduct of just the the almost realistic graphics of today not having those cartoony type characters right. but it's just you know it's really impressive and, and a credit to the characters the people the people in the book at nintendo and sega that those characters have sustained for the, as long as they have you know what's interesting too about nintendo is that they they've largely kept the same conservative mindset about how, in, not just in the content of the games, but also in the way they run their business. They they never really changed, did they? They they adjusted, but they they didn't become a different company when Sega became a different company, and it's working for them. And it's funny because everyone's always predicting Nintendo's demise, and like yeah. the Wii U has been kind of tough for them, but um, they're back, right? Like the game quality is back. They have a lot of great first party titles. You know, now That's that you're you really learn it on this subject. What's your what's your feeling going forward for all these companies? As you know, Sega and our Sony and Microsoft uh, battle it out. Nintendo just kind of sits there. They led the market <laughs> in the last generation of consoles, and nobody knew it. Yeah, um, you know, they've definitely uh, stayed the course. the The last section of the book, there's you know, it's divided into five seconds. Sections is called the the tortoise and the hare, and that has definitely been Nintendo's strategy to be slow and steady, and, and hopefully win the race. And you know, if we had had the conversation about the book in 1994, we would have said, what's wrong with Nintendo? Why aren't they waking up? Why aren't they changing what they're doing? Uh, but by 1996, they had sort of surpassed Sega and were back on top. Um, so, you know, in a race, which is really what the console wars are and what this whole business is, you know, it's really just a matter of where the, the end point is in your race. So nowadays, you know, we could say Nintendo's struggling. If we had had this conversation six months ago, we would have said they were really struggling. Right. Uh, but your point about their games. I was at E3 um, a few weeks ago. Um, I thought Nintendo had the best games of everybody there. And uh, even in just the past few weeks with uh, Mario Kart 8 and with the games coming on the horizon, like the Super Smash Brothers, I think that they're getting back on track. I don't know that they can defeat Microsoft or Sony, and I don't even know that they want to. You know, they really have established their niche, which was helped to be defined by the Sega era. They, they make, they're like the Disney of video games, yeah. and they're not going to change who they are. They've had plenty of opportunities to change 
the kinds of games they make and also the kinds of things they do. They, you know, they could have started a theme park. They could get really much more into movies and all those things. And maybe some of those are good ideas. Maybe some of them are bad ideas. But they, but for now, they continue to stay the course, and it's been working for them for 30 years now. Yeah, there was a great little bit on uh, Comedy Central. Um, there's, this, there's a show called After Midnight. It comes on after Colbert, and they they were le they let off. It was great earned media for Nintendo. They let off kind of showing the contrast between Nintendo showing um, the Yoshi game where the, the character is made out of a ball of yarn uh, to the new Mortal Kombat on the PlayStation, which is the most <laughs> vile thing I have ever seen. Um, yeah. <laughs> it just, you know, it, it, nothing changes even though it does. And, you know, and that was something during the course of, of Sega's development that Kleminsky was really torn about, right? The violence level and the, and the, as the graphic reality, realities increased on the, the systems, he, he was really uh, of two minds in this, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the, the, one thing you could say about Tom before and after his time at Sega is that he really was focused on dealing with and selling to young kids, and he always admired, you know, that demographic and their their imaginations. And so he was um, fearful about what the future of video games meant, while also realizing that he was the one helping to chart that future. Um, so he tried to find a way to um, have his cake and eat it too, um, in, in the best sense possible and, and create the ratings council and, and Sega did. They were the first company or the first big first, uh, first party company to create a rating system. And it still led to congressional hearings on violence in video games. Right. Um, but you know, he, he was conflicted and uh, as were a lot of the people um, that I spoke with, cause a lot of them, you know, were in their mid thirties, early forties and, and had kids that were about that age and were players. And so they thought about it on a personal level as well. Yeah, no, it was uh, it was it's been quite an interesting thing. Now as a parent, I look at this so differently than I did. <laughs> now I know I'm grown up, right? Because it was always like <laughs> they don't know what I'm talking about. You know, Senator Lieberman was my was my senator, so uh, it was it was a very Connecticut-based kind of uh, kind of story. So all right, so we've got the documentary coming out, and uh, so so where can people when that documentary is released? Is that going to go to uh, to theaters, or is it going to be uh, distributed digitally? How how is that going to uh, reach the uh, the fans out there? Uh, I think we will cross that bridge when we come to it. it. Um, you know, I hope that it's in every theater around the world. Um, but we'll see. Um, it's been really fun to work on this. I've been doing it with my business partner, Jonah Toulis, and it's nice um, to be able, you know, I definitely have some postpartum depression now that the book's out and, and I have no more to write at this time. And it's it's a really great way to continue working with this material and the subject matter and also being able to uh, tell the whole story, the story in a whole different way with different kinds of media. Yeah, I'm looking, I'm looking forward to it. So you'll have at least uh, one viewer here, and I'll take my wife, too. So, right. so I'll let you know when, it's, uh, when we get closer to the time. But we don't know at this point. Um, you know, Seth and Evan are producing that, as is Scott Rudin. Um, so I think that we'll be able to get it out to the world in the best way possible, because those guys are the best at what they do. Um, and it's a we'll lot of think. work, too, because you've got to go, go re-interview everybody, really, right? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> So it's almost like writing the book again, but now you're, you've got a, a film version yep. of it. So then the feature film obviously will be, will be uh, down the road. Any plans to look at the next generation of consoles? I think where your book, you, you, you leave the book off in a perfect spot where you can start a sequel, which is, you know, the, the ultimate fall of Sega where they <laughs> just abruptly left the console world. Is that something in your mind or are you going to kind of take a little break? Um, I don't know. Um, so I guess that means I'm taking a little break. Um, mm -hmm. To be honest, when I finished it, I thought I was done with writing about video games, uh, but I miss it so much, and there's still and so many great stories have have been told to me since then. Um, but like I said at the top of the show, you know, if not me, I really hope that someone takes the torch and writes about the next era or things that I missed in the book. You know, as much as it is a 500-page book, it, it's not at all comprehensive. It, it talks a lot about Sega and Nintendo. It's probably uh, a pretty comprehensive account of of Tom Kalinske's time there. But there's still so much. That, that is out there and so many great stories and great narratives as well. Um, so we'll see. Um, but I, you know, it's a, it's a really fun industry and it's even more exciting than I ever would have imagined. It, it is. It just uh, it was it was fascinating at the time to be in the middle of it. It was also fascinating to see um, how these people were trying to sell to me and to you, <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> and and it really you know kind of get a feel for it from uh, you know from their side of the of the aisle. And it was uh, it was really fascinating. We we used to call like the customer service numbers. We used to do like the three way calling that you could do on the telephone, you know, the, before the cell phone. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we used to talk to like the the Sega and Nintendo customer service people. They were so cool. They just loved talking to kids about you know what was coming up. Yeah. We used to do that in between 
clean game playing. So it was really, it was really neat to, to see what was going on inside those walls when we were uh, talking to those folks. So, uh, well, Blake, thank you so much for, for joining me this morning. It's, uh, it was a great book. Everyone watching uh, either now or when we uh, do uh, the, the recorded version up later, uh, go out and buy the book. It's great. I, uh, I bought thank it you. on, uh, on uh, Audible and on <laughs> uh, the, uh, the Kindle version so I could uh, keep listening and reading uh, and get through it as quickly as possible. I thought it was just, I just couldn't stop uh, absorbing the story here. So I, I really think you did an excellent job on that. We're looking forward to uh, the documentary and uh, anything else, any, any place people can find you online to get more? Yeah, uh, my Twitter handle is Blake J. Harris NYC. That's all one word, Blake J. Harris NYC. And uh, if you do get a chance to check out the book, please let me know what you think, good or bad. And mostly if you have any questions along the way, um, as I'm sure many people do, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. I really love this story and I want to fill any holes you might have and, and send you down any other additional rabbit holes. So please come out and talk to me. Um, and also Tom Kalinske's on Twitter. He's pretty active now. Um, he's on there as well. Oh, I got to follow him. That's, uh, that's yeah. Good. Yeah. Cause he's, he's I think it's some... Thomas T. Kalinske, which great. is gonna... strange because it's not his middle initial. But... <laughs> it's probably all they had available for him when he did <laughs> yeah. it. So great. Well, uh, Blake, thanks again for joining us. And this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching.